Hello everyone, what's going on? It's the one and only coming back to you with a video review on one of the best budget phones currently available on the market. Come to think of it, it's been quite some time since I have reviewed a Samsung device. To be exact, it's been since April of 2020. So a Samsung review is more than overdue on my channel. And this time I set my eyes on one of Samsung's budget slash mid range devices the Samsung Galaxy A53 5G. I know it's a mouthful. The Galaxy A53 goes head to head with the likes of the Pixel 6a and Apple's iPhone SE for the title of best budget phone out currently in the market. And in my opinion, should be a top pick, especially if you're already familiar with Android devices. There's a lot to like here and all at a pretty attractive price point. While it lags behind its main competitors in some departments like camera quality, it greatly excels in many other aspects, including much longer promised software support, a great and buttery smooth 120Hz display, and some decent power under the hood for the price. I was pleasantly surprised at the user experience and performance this smartphone provides, and this is coming from a huge Apple sheep who is heavily invested in the Apple ecosystem. The Galaxy A53 is by no means a brand new device. As a matter of fact, it was released back in March of 2022, with a refresh most likely right around the corner. However, I figured I'd still give it a shot and post a review for anyone who recently got their hands on the A53 for the holiday season, or for anyone currently shopping around for a well-rounded budget phone with plenty of great amazing features in early 2023 we got a lot to cover here so buckle up and make sure you have some snacks and maybe a drink nearby as we roll that intro and dive right into an unboxing you ready let's do this <laughs> All right, all right, what do we have here? It's our brand new Galaxy A53 box that features a nice and clear image of both the front and back of the device, surrounded by a white background along with Galaxy A53 5G branding and Samsung branding towards the bottom. Oddly, we only feature one line of branding on our left hand side, but Samsung apparently discriminates against the top and right side of the box since it's just blank. Serial number information is at the bottom and on the back we have the contents of our box as well as some regulatory information. We don't feature any pull tabs and instead have two circular clear stickers. So grab a knife or some scissors nearby to safely cut those tabs open, not like me who accidentally cut my thumb. Lift open the lid and the first thing we are greeted with is the front of our Galaxy A53 wrapped in this glossy plastic. As always, we set that off to the side for now and dig deeper into the contents of our box. It looks like Samsung hit us with the classic box within a box trick, as this other smaller box with Samsung branding on the front is what houses our quick start guide as well as a SIM ejection tool. Essential for switching out your SIM card and popping it in so you can activate it on your cellular network. Inside though is a quick start guide that also doubles as your terms and conditions. At this point, most of us are pretty used to Android phones and its respective OS, so let's dig deeper and we'll find our standard USB-C to USB-C cable used to charge up the device, but do know a wall adapter is not included so you will have to purchase that separately. Sadly, that's all we get in the box, so now let's return to the star of the show, remove the glossy plastic that protects the phone's display during shipment, Press the power button on the right hand side and then wait for the Samsung logo to power on to commence setup. Alright boys and girls, now that we got the unboxing out of the way, first things first, we gotta quickly go over pricing and availability. So, the Galaxy A53 5G can currently be picked up directly from Samsung's website for $449, with a starting storage of 128GB that can be expanded if you opt to up it with a micro SD card that, of course, needs to be purchased separately and supports storage all the way up to 1TB. The Galaxy A53 is kind of boring in the sense that there's not many options for colors, with it only being offered in a singular color choice, and that is what Samsung dubs Awesome Black. Which don't get me wrong, it's cool, but it would have been even more awesome if we had more color options here. So a minor L on Samsung's part, but shouldn't be a deal breaker for the majority of people. Even so, for $449, you get a decent phone. I'm not gonna lie and say that this right here is an amazing value. So let me just explain my reasoning a bit, starting out with the design of the phone. The design here is simple yet effective. It's quite clear that Samsung didn't try to reinvent the wheel here. And honestly, at this price point, simplicity is one of its stronger suits. 
boots. With it being a budget model, the materials the phone is comprised of are, of course, of lesser quality than some of the more premium builds of the Galaxy S series of phones. Here, we feature a plastic body that at times does feel a bit cheap. Around the perimeter of the phone, instead of it being a metallic band, it's more of this glossy plastic that does retain a ton of fingerprints but it does feel sturdy enough to make you comfortable while holding it in the hands. Again, a small nitpick is also on the backside. It kind of has this matte-like finish, and it does get smudges and does pick up on fingerprints a little easier than some other phones. So if you're one of those tech heads that despises to have smudges or fingerprints on the body of your phone, you may want to invest in a sturdy case so that this is a non-issue. We have Samsung branding here towards the bottom in a lighter gray text, but what immediately catches the eye is that camera module situated at the top left corner of the back of the device and resembles the camera setup featured on the Galaxy S20 series, but alas, is far inferior to the more flagship models. We'll cover the cameras in just a second. The camera module does stick out slightly, similar to how the camera module sticks out on the iPhone Pro line, so laying it flat on a surface like a table will cause the phone to be angled ever so slightly and might rock here and there if typing on it. When looking at it from the back, honestly, the Galaxy A53 is pretty boring, but it does thankfully feature an IP67 water and dust resistant rating. So an accidental drop in the community pool, for example, should be A-OK -okay and cause no damage to the phone. All right, so now flipping the phone over is where things start to get a bit more juicy with the A53 featuring a splendid 6.5 inch AMOLED display, which is huge, especially at this price point. OLED displays show colors as richer and way more vibrant, not to mention the deep blacks that offer tremendous contrast versus the standard LCD panels that are commonly found on budget phones around this level. And not only that, but amongst its main rivals, the iPhone SE and the Pixel 6a, it stands as the largest display of the trio. Here you get FHD resolution and best yet that buttery smooth 120Hz refresh rate, but it's not adaptive. I'll cover what that means later on in the review. For comparison, Apple's own version of this, which they call ProMotion, is only reserved for their Pro models, and in order to unlock this quote-unquote premium feature from Apple, you must, at a minimum, fork over $1,000 for 120Hz refresh rate on iPhones, so it's so nice to see it featured here at under 500 bucks. At this price, this is hands down the most fluid and best display I've seen yet at this price level. The display is nice and large enough to comfortably enjoy media such as watching movies or your favorite YouTuber. It definitely is one of its main selling points and the design on the front is also modern looking with minimal bezels protruding into the usable screen real estate as well as featuring a hole punch design for the front facing camera that does double for biometric authentication and there is a fingerprint scanner embedded underneath the display as well. Which speaking of though, now is a perfect time to transition into discussing the camera hardware present here. Cameras are one of the highest priorities for a ton of consumers, so the Samsung budget offering has a lot to live up to, especially considering the iPhone SE and Pixel 6a provide not only excellent camera hardware, but their computational photography, especially on the Pixel line, are superb in this regard. On the front, we feature a 32 megapixel selfie camera, which on paper covers way more ground than does Apple's offering, for example, which only sports a measly 7 megapixel sensor on the front. And for the most part, the selfies it produces are pretty decent. The images seem to appear brighter as compared to something like the Pixel 6a's front camera, and it senses skin tones pretty well, especially on my tan skin. The colors are pretty accurate. Now, the back sensors is where things get really exciting. As you can probably already tell, the Galaxy A53 sports a quad camera setup. It looks like five, but one of them is for flash, and each of the sensors is designed to do something slightly different. So what you get is an all-in-one photographer's paradise, at least on the surface, kind of like a Swiss army knife, but for cameras. You get a whopping 64 megapixel main sensor joined by a 12 megapixel ultra wide, a five megapixel macro lens, and five megapixel depth shooters. The last two, however, feels like a beta, and I don't know exactly why Samsung slapped these on here, rather than focusing on improving the two that actually matter, and the ones that most people will use, which is the main sensor and the ultra wide. Of course, when it comes to photography, everyone will have their own thoughts and opinions, likes and dislikes. The thing is, I don't think they're needed, to be honest. 
Other phone manufacturers have their camera hardware to effectively switch into macro mode when it senses that an object is very close to the phone. Take the iPhone 14 Pro Max, for example, which does not have a dedicated depth sensor, but will auto switch for you to better capture small objects or simply capture objects close to the sensor. And as far as the depth sensor, if Samsung decides to stick with this, it still has a lot of refining to be made. Again, other phones have dedicated scanners or sensors, like the LiDAR scanner on iPhone Pro models that essentially do this and also aid in AI. And so for this reason, it's unlikely I nor most people will ever get much use from these two sensors. The standout ones are the main sensor and the ultra wide, which do provide with crisp and bouncy photographs that appear true to life and aren't overblown on the computational side like other phones that make images look fake and almost HDR like. As usual, I won't go too in depth on camera quality or comparisons as this would drag this video to be 30 minutes plus. But don't worry, after this video review, I do plan on making a camera comparison test between this and the iPhone SE, and maybe I'll even throw in the Pixel 6a in there. In order to not miss out, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below and ring that bell notification to always be in the loop whenever I release a brand new video. All in all though, for a phone under $500, the Galaxy A53 provides you with excellent true-to-life shots that hardly anyone will be hard-pressed to complain about. Obviously, if you want the best image quality and the best computational photography plus versatility, you'll definitely want to dish out a bit more and go with one of Samsung's more premium flagships such as the Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra. Now, let's go over performance and battery, seeing as how apart from cameras, this two are two important factors to consider when in the market for a brand new smartphone. First, starting off with performance, I couldn't help but notice that the OS seems sluggish with some pretty noticeable lag here and there upon launching some applications, as well as the user interface just not being as fluid, despite the amazing OLED 120Hz display with that increased refresh rate. It features the Exynos 1280 chip that won't win any performance races, actually far from it. This is not the phone to get if you're looking for a performance behemoth. It offers decent performance. It's definitely far from being the best though. I ran a Geekbench test real quick since I was just a bit curious. And as you can see, the A53 vastly underperforms in direct comparison to one of its main rivals, the iPhone SE. The Galaxy A53 honestly gets obliterated in terms of raw benchmarks with it coming in at 743 in single core and only 1842 on the multi-core side. Honestly, not very impressive. On the other hand, the iPhone SE comes in with a more than double score of a single core score of 1642 and 3141 on multi-core, completely leaving the A53 in the dust. Of course, benchmarks aren't everything, but it does point at a decent indication of how well we can expect the smartphone to perform. The Galaxy A53 does thankfully come on board with 6GB of RAM and is very well optimized for the operating system, just again, please don't expect for this phone to be a powerhouse because it's not, but does offer enough power under the hood for most casual users. And in terms of gaming, everything runs pretty well, but on games such as Asphalt 9, I don't know, there's noticeable lag and things just don't run as fluidly as compared to some of its competitors. And in terms of battery, because of its larger footprint, it's able to pack in a much larger physical battery, coming in packing a 5,000 milliamp hour battery. Other phones such as the Pixel 6 Pro also feature similar size batteries, so you'd think this phone would be a battery champ, right? Well, kind of. From my own experience, the phone does provide all day battery. But what does considerably drag it down is that 120 hertz refresh rate. And by the way, it's not an adaptive refresh rate, which means it won't tone up or down automatically and instead just stays put. And this will be like a sort of weight on the battery. Even then, by the end of the night, with reasonable brightness and the 120Hz mode on, the Galaxy A53 ends the day for me with roughly 25% juice left which isn't bad at all. However, if you tone it down to 60 Hertz, you can very well expect for this to provide an additional hour or two of additional use, extending the battery life even further. So in summary, the battery here is above average, but is not the number one contender out in the market in terms of battery health. But within its range, it definitely outclasses the iPhone SE and the Pixel 6a, both of which only feature a 60 hertz display. So if it's battery you're looking for in a budget model, this one here is a really great pick. In the end though, what's my verdict? 
The phone is a really well-rounded device with a few compromises, but it also has aspects to it that makes it excel in certain regards. My only major nitpick is the lack of gestures here. It has a virtual home button, if you will, that you need to pull up on certain apps or games that hides it in order to return home effectively having you make two clicks in order to return to your home page. I really wish this would have featured the same swiping gesture like most other modern smartphones, but it's something you get used to pretty quickly. For the price, it's certainly something I would recommend to most Android users. Sure, the construction may feel a little cheaper due to the plastic materials, but there's enough here of substance that qualifies this as a serious contender under the $500 price point. It outclasses the Pixel 6a in terms of display quality and size and bests both of its main competitors in terms of battery. Camera quality is decent but certainly isn't the best and many would argue that phones such as the Pixel 6a handles computational photography a lot better than the A53. For now, I'm very confident in saying that this is the best cheap Android phone that is relatively within reach for the majority of consumers without spending an arm and a leg. The iPhone SE surely is more powerful but it's the larger battery and brighter, larger display with 120 hertz refresh rate that makes it truly stand out amongst its rivals. In the end, the choice is yours and it's up to you as to what you prioritize. Do you prefer a larger screen and a larger battery? Is performance at the forefront for your needs or are you looking for the best camera? I'd love to hear all of your comments down below, especially all of my Android users. Have you had any experience with budget Android phones? And if so, what are your thoughts on the Galaxy A53? Let me know in the comments below. And with that, I'm clocking out for now, but I cannot wait to catch you all in my next video.